I'm Tan Sui Che, the immediate past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Good morning and good afternoon to the people in Asia. Welcome to the penultimate event in this sessional year's IFOA Thought Leadership Program and the final one in the behavioral series. This program has been generously sponsored by Hong Kong based IFOA fellow, Dr. Patrick Poon, and this has enabled us to host the entire program free of charge to members and non-members. And at the last count, there were over 400 people tuning into today's webinar. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all. The IFOA Thought Leadership Program seeks to bring thought leadership to the foreground in line with our, in line with our desire to reposition the IFOA as a center of key societal debates. Today's event aims to shift the profession's attention from our traditional domains and core skill sets. It seeks to engage and encourage the members of the IFOA in the widening of our skill sets and the diversifying of our mindsets to help bring our vision of a transformed IFOA and the profession to life. It is also in keeping with a growing desire within the profession to be more outward looking, to be bolder, to be more influential, to move beyond technical debates and to take the conversations to a higher level. And I'm very pleased to say that the Thought Leadership Program will continue into the next sessional year. There's one final event remaining in this year's program. On the 16th of July, past presidents, Ronnie Bowie, Paul Thornton, Jane Curtis in the chair, and myself, and the past chair of the management board, Sally Bridgeland, will discuss on how we are doing as a profession. We will reflect on the progress the profession has made in the last few years, the drivers for change in the years to come, and the steps actuaries will need to take in order for us to remain relevant, influential, and impactful. The panel will also debate why actuaries need to adapt and move into wider areas, and how the IFOA's BSMD strategy can support this reinvention. Some of the likely discussion areas are our unique long-term lens and the repositioning of the profession for the wider fields, the impact of technology on the personal and unusual journeys of the panelists, and how as a body, we can position ourselves to be more consequential in addressing the big sustainability and societal challenges of our time. I do hope you are able to join us for these sessions. In the last few weeks and over the course of this particular behavioral focus series, we discuss the personal qualities necessary to navigate the changes unleashed by the digital revolution, the mindsets and values required to undertake cultural and organizational transformation, and the leadership and intellectual frameworks necessary to make progress in the solving of wicked and systemic problems of our time. The conversation continues today that we are joined by leadership expert, David Rook of Hart Hill Consulting. For actuaries, the famous Reddington quote, Frank Reddington quote, the actuary who is only an actuary is not an actuary on which this event is named after is more relevant today than ever before. In order for actuaries to remain relevant and influential in our organizations and in our wider society, we must break out of our traditional norms and psyches and apply our skills to wider domains as the IFOA's BSMD strategy advocates. Following his presentation, David will be joined by Stephen Mann, CEO of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and Anusha Tavaraja, Elion's Regional Chief CEO, Life and Health for Asia Pacific, for a panel discussion around the themes of the session. Now that I've provided you with the context, I'm delighted to say a few words about today's speakers. David co-founded Hart Hill Consulting in 1985. Since then, he has been working at senior levels internationally. Inquiry lies at the heart of his work. He believes as context and people change, what is useful can only be understood and improved, and improved through explorations that move fluidly between the personal, the relational, and the systemic. Since 1997, his work has focused on what has become 
known as vertical development and in supporting leaders to develop the capacities to survive and thrive in an increasingly complex and challenging world. Never, believes David, have systemic understanding and capabilities been more important. David has published several books, including Personal and Organizational Transformations, and has co-written the award-winning Seven Transformations of Leadership article for the Harvard Business Review, Stephen Mann. Originally qualified as a lawyer, Stephen has worked extensively with the actuarial community throughout a career in financial services. He has been a board director of the Aviva Life Business, responsible for strategy, business services, and major capital projects. More, in, more recently, he served as chief executive officer at the Police Mutual Group. Stephen has also been chair of Aviva's With Profits Committee and the UK Retail Investment Business and a done executive director at Aliko UK and the, and the independent member of the Audit and Risk Committee at the College of Policing. Anusha Tavaraja. Anusha is Elion's Regional Chief Executive Officer, Life and Health for Asia Pacific and a member of Elion's Asia Regional Executive Board, which is responsible for setting out and executing Elion's growth strategy in Asia. Before that, Anusha was at AIA, where she became the first female CEO in the AIA group when she was appointed to head AIA Malaysia in June 2015. Anusha was also the president of the Life Insurance Association of Malaysia and the chairperson of the Malaysian Insurance Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand over the floor to David, I just want to let you know that you can submit a question at any, at any time via the online Q&A function, Q&A function on Zoom. And I would encourage you all to do so. So David, the floor is yours. So thank you so much for that welcome. And I'm just uh, uh, sharing the slides now. So um, uh, we're exploring this, this question, this quote um, from Frank Reddington, which is, which is exploring the idea of what it is uh, to truly be an actuary. And of course, this is, this is a, a, a challenging statement in itself. Um, and the, the reason why we've, um, we've sought to, um, uh, uh, to, sorry, my screen's not moving forward. The reason we've 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 um, we've sought to, to to do this is to put it into uh, into a uh, into a global context. So, what we'll start to explore during this session uh, are a, a number of different themes that will that will run forward. So, the first theme, the first exploration, which I think is relevant to this uh, to this quote, is um, about the times we live in, and I think this question question of um, is are these times truly unprecedented? Is something demanded of us um, that has never before been demanded? It seems to me this is a highly uh, significant uh, question because it leads into a question about our capacity uh, and our capacity to respond uh, to those challenges. So we'll start, we'll start our journey there um, and then we'll look at, and this is perhaps the, um, the material that, 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 that may be new to some of you, uh, we'll, we'll bring um, this exploration of our uh, uniquely human capacity to make meaning. And I'll unwrap that uh, as we move into the session. And then um, that leads us into a question about wisdom uh, and what it would be um, to be a wise actuary. Um, and I think there's some really interesting uh, questions there, which lead again into our uh, into the, the the issue of developmental implications and what we should do about all of this. So one of my deep desires uh, is that this session uh, is is uh, practical and useful for you. So I'll bring in some ideas, but I hope by the end, um, uh, as well as some, uh, uh, hopefully some stimulating thinking, there'll be some um, ideas that might uh, impact the way that you work. So it's very much a global, uh, a global context that we're working in. Um, never before have we had a, a sense of the connection um, uh, between 
every aspect of life on the planet. Uh, and of course, the, the recent pandemic has done um, nothing uh, more than or nothing more dramatic than to illustrate that interconnectivity. So, so it's very much in this global context that this, that, that this um, conversation is, is occurring. And of course, the question that I was asking is, you know, are these unprecedented times, both at a kind of global, social, um, political, environmental um, uh, level? Uh, and of course, many, many commentators um, point to the times being uh, absolutely unprecedented. And yet, and yet, um, there, um, the, in, within my father's life, uh, he, uh, he fought uh, in a world war which stretched across the entire planet. Um, he, um, the whole um, economic and social structure worldwide was destroyed um, and uh, uh, people had to reconstruct lives. Uh, there were is it, uh, enormous uh, movements of people across the planet. So one might argue that in 1945, um, the, the, the planet um, uh, faced unprecedented uh, times. Um, and yet, and yet we might say uh, of our current time, that never before, perhaps since we were hunter-gatherers, and there's some very interesting conversations about the quality of life of uh, hunter-gatherers and the, the notion that life wasn't mean, brutal and short, but actually there was more leisure time uh, at that period of our history than, the, than there has ever been. But that's a, <laughs> that's a sideline. Um, but never before since those times have we lived such long lives have we had so few people die violently? And I think that's a really interesting consideration because it asks some questions about, uh, is there a, an evolution of something positive uh, within, within us as human beings? Uh, have so few people starved or been hungry um, uh, and have so few people been enslaved? So I think it's a really um, a very, very interesting picture that we have here because there's, um, there's, on the one hand, uh, where, you know, we're facing, I think, uh, arguably uh, crises of uh, unimaginable scale. Um, and on the other hand, there seems to be some trajectory, some movement uh, towards some really positive qualities. And what I'd like to, to, to explore is what's the nature of this and, and particularly how does this sit with us, uh, with us human beings? So I want to pull that back down, if I might, to uh, a question of, uh, of, of leadership uh, in organisations, um, because I know that's the context within, within which uh, probably all of us listening today and engaged today uh, work. So is it really getting more complex for leaders? Well, I was in conversations recently um, with a, a senior uh, tax uh, director of a very, very large uh, multinational uh, uh, organization with, with truly global reach. And um, uh, he's uh, in his, I would suppose, 50s, um, and he was talking about the world that he used to uh, work in. And he used to uh, describe uh, this as being the context in which uh, he worked. Tax, op tax optimization pays little as possible within the law using visible and obscure mechanisms. Primary job, keep us all out of prison. And that's not to say that that world didn't require depth knowledge and an enormous amount of skill. Uh, it absolutely did. And uh, uh, clearly the, the chap I was talking to who wasn't called Gabriel, of course, um, uh, was a very, very experienced and skillful man. But then he went on to describe the world in which he currently uh, holds this role. Um, and it's still tax optimization, but now, uh, this, the organization he represents has to be uh, visible and accountable as an international citizen. And there are uh, uh, not only governments, um, but um, NGOs and individuals holding that organization uh, visibly uh, uh, responsible for its activities. So it needs to be, and he needs to lead this, it needs to be fair and seen to be fair. So not just fair, but seen to be fair. Um, and he says, unlike his previous world, he spends a very great deal of time in, in dialogue, 
with governments, but not only governments, uh, with NGOs. Um, so in fact, he was uh, the very afternoon um, uh, that I met him, he was off uh, to, to, to meet um, a green uh, lobby group uh, who uh, uh, had some positions that they wanted to make very clear to him. He said, not only all of that, but I now have, because of the visibility, have to ensure high internal standards of integrity. Um, that there's a, uh, that the visibility makes my world very different. And finally, he says, I have to be socially uh, media attuned and responsive, that things move quickly, very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, if I'm not engaged in, in that, um, then uh, there can be some real uh, damage done to the organization or opportunities for positive promotion uh, missed. So what he was describing uh, is a world that has far more uh, in it, many, many more dimensions to be held and managed uh, by him. And clearly, as you look at those two, the, the, the differences, you'd say there are some uh, changes, some, some increases uh, in the demands placed upon, uh, upon Gabriel. So this leads us to a really uh, interesting question, I think, which is about our individual capacity um, to respond to the scale of the challenge. So my, uh, my uh, position is that the scale of the challenge is indeed increasing, that Gabrielle is a good example uh, of the type of role complexity um, that is occurring as a consequence of the environmental uh, uh, the changes that are occurring. And so um, we, we have some demands upon our individual human capacity to respond to that. And it's no, I think, coincidence that, 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 it, that increasingly stress, uh, overload, pressure uh, is, a, uh, is a dimension that's talked about in relationship to leadership. So our capacity, I think, is being stretched in, in a number of different ways. Um, and first of all, it's being stretched intellectually. So I think we need to know more stuff in more dimensions. We, we need to be aware of more things, read more material, listen to more perspectives. Uh, there's more uh, in kind of almost every dimension uh, of that um, uh, to, be, to be taken into account. Not only that, I think, I think that the, the challenge of our times uh, uh, is also emotional, that there are um, uh, real roller coasters to be moved through. And again, we'd only need to look back to the last uh, 18 months or so of the pandemic to see the kind of real emotional challenges that have uh, arisen for individual leaders, not only to look after themselves uh, in, in, in the isolated context that they found themselves in, or we found ourselves in, but also to ensure that their, um, their colleagues uh, are also uh, navigating that really difficult situation well. So, so I think there's a, there's a, a level of challenge which is emotional. Um, it's always been, of course, a level of challenge, uh, which is moral um, about the decisions we make um, and, and, and what backs that. Uh, it seems to me that increasingly um, this is a, a, a question of, that we needs to be explored. And then uh, finally, but of course, in no sense least, there's uh, a capacity to run organizations in a way that meet the standards that are demanded of them um, uh, and yet are profitable, productive um, uh, at, at, sim at the same time. And so there's a real level of organizational challenge. Um, and last week, um, those of you who heard from Professor Anthony Hodgson, uh, he, he used this slide and I just wanted to, 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 uh, to keep a continuity to what he said, but also it's an extremely useful slide. And at the center, it says this, this is the context in which the actu actuarial professional sphere is working. And actually, of course, we could put almost any professional sphere uh, into the center of this diagram. Uh, and it, it, immediately around it, he, he says there are challenges of escalating complexity, which I think we've all, I've already been beginning to talk about. There are challenges of confusing futures what will happen in the future and how much more volatile and uncertain is the future today than it was, let's say, 50 years ago as people looked forward. Um, and then the question that I'm dealing with uh, today is the, 
the missing mind capacities or the capacities that we might grow and develop and all of that placed into a wider uh, a wider context um, and just at the bottom right there he talks about the anthropocene realities that this is a a, a, a unique uh, time in uh, in the history of the planet uh, as well as the, the history of humanity and so i think it is challenging to place your work as a professional uh, into that much, much wider context. Uh, and it's a necessity. I think if we step away from seeing our work in this wider, wider context, then we're missing something that's enormously vital. So the good news, I think, the good news here is that um, we have this unique human capacity to give meaning to the world uh, around us and the universe that is within us. And of course, this, um, this capacity has got us into some of the trouble that we're in, but this capacity also uh, has the ability to, to help us uh, uh, work our way uh, out of it. Um, but it is a unique human capacity. It seems that no other uh, uh, <clears throat> species on the planet has quite the ability to be conscious of our consciousness, to notice ourselves as thinking, creative beings. Uh, and that does separate us in some ways, not that I want to in any sense encourage a feeling of separation, but it's to notice this uh, capability, um, this, this deep, deep human nature uh, that, we, that we have. And of course, this gives rise to, to I think, uh, well, at least two of these three uh, defining human activities. So, so first of all, we are engaged in a search for meaning. We, it, if something happens to us, um, if we have a sudden disappointment, uh, if we have a sudden success, we're often looking for the meaning behind it. And of course, our bigger search for meaning is the meaning of our life. But actually, we have much, many, many more micro searches for meaning as we navigate our way through uh, our, our days and our weeks. Um, and um, we also um, construct meaning. So we're always, not only are we searching for meaning, we're also in the business of constructing it. So we're making sense of things. We're building, literally building constructs um, such as the future or risk or insurance. All of those are mental, are mental constructs. Risk, in a sense, doesn't exist uh, other than we have built the idea of risk. Um, and, and clearly no other um, uh, species does that. Uh, and this has a real consequence for us because if we're in the business of, in the process of building constructs, then we can choose which constructs those are. And of course, our entire thinking uh, structure, our entire meaning-making structure is built upon beliefs and constructs. Um, and the great uh, opportunity of the future is our ability to, to, to change and to navigate those. Um, just to say that the um, third uh, defining human activity is that we have sex with pleasure. Uh, it, we're probably not entirely alone in that, that Bonobos, uh, which species of monkey, seems to share that. Um, but um, I, I wouldn't want to miss that out as something that defines us as, uh, as species. It seems to have affected our behavior enormously. Um, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to talk about meaning making. So in the context of meaning making, uh, there's a question that I think is really important, which is um, as we become more capable, as we grow older, do we become wiser? Can we become wiser? So that this seems to me to be um, vital because if the answer to that is no, that, that, that with age, doesn't come wisdom, then, then we're, we're going to be really struggling. Um, and I think the answer is a mixed one in a sense. I think, yes, of course, wisdom can come with experience, can come with aging, but I think the challenge to it is, and it doesn't necessarily come with wisdom. So I, I want to explore this because I think it's uh, it's it's crucial to the uh, to the question that we're, we're engaged in today. 
And I've been working um, with this, um, with this uh, construct, with this idea, which is about the nature of human development. Uh, and uh, it's based upon uh, multiple lineages of, uh, of work. Um, probably uh, I'll point most to the work of, uh, of the um, uh, psychologist Piaget, who looked at um, the development of children and said, this is very interesting. What we can see from birth are very clear stages in the development of the child, not just physical stages, but stages in which the brain seems to operate in different ways and in which, in fact, meaning making, relationship to the world, sense making of the world can be seen to move through very distinct uh, stages, uh, each of which is a progression on the next stage. So that's what I want to apply and have been applying for three decades now um, to the development of uh, us human beings beyond the childhood stage. And a number of people have, have uh, contributed to this, to this idea that uh, we have this capacity to grow wisdom over time by developing the way that we think about things. And it's the model actually has um, a include and extend um, uh, capacity. In other words, if we were to take the meaning making capacities that go with this Russian doll, um, these are capabilities that we have. When we learn something new, we include that Russian doll in the next Russian doll. So we don't replace the capacity, we simply um, uh, include it and extend it uh, into, the next, into the next capacity and so on through. So what we have here is a metaphor of, uh, of growth in capacity. Um, and if we're thinking about those capacities as, as having some moral dimension, then we might also be talking about uh, a growth in wisdom. And so the, 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 the position that I'm taking is that it is possible over time to move, to increase our, uh, uh, our capabilities and to do that in a series of stages of different and more or less defined stages. And these stages uh, in, 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 in my work and the work of others have been described as action logics, which are internal structures by which I mean we can't see them. And they impact with it. That's going on inside our, uh, our, our mind brain, um, uh, uh, but, it, but they're not visible. And they impact how we make sense of the world. We impact absolutely where we pay our attention, um, where, we, where we give our attention to. Uh, it gives rise to many of our values and assumptions. And crucially, importantly, these go on to shape our actions. So when we talk about leadership, and what leaders do, we're actually talking about the end result of a process of meaning making and meaning construction, which leads to those actions. Now, most approaches to leadership focus on the actions. I think that's been a mistake. Uh, I think we need to uh, encourage ourselves to think more deeply about the process of sense making that arrives uh, at our actions. Now, these action logics uh, in, the, um, in the Russian doll um, metaphor, the, the action logics are quite separate. And in fact, um, I'm going to describe to you four of these, what we describe as, uh, as, as uh, action logics, four key action logics uh, in relationship to, to leaders in particular. The, the um, percentages I've put at the top here are the percentages that we have discovered from profiling 12,000 leaders worldwide. Uh, and incidentally, the profile seems to be um, relevant uh, and appropriate to any developed culture, whether it's in the West or the East, um, uh, which has been kind of fascinating because it, it says something about there being an underlying, underlying meaning-making process, which is um, uh, independent of, uh, of, of local culture. Anyway, 13% of, uh, of leaders profile at what's described, watch the label here, the label's just one word, it doesn't describe the whole thing, but it's expert. Uh, and in the expert action logic, there's one right way to do things, 
we, if only we can find the best process, the best way, then we'll have cracked it. Um, so, so the search is for um, perfected methods and processes. Detail, therefore, is massively important. And then that last bullet point, um, which is a really significant one for this action logic, um, my view of the world makes most sense to me. Therefore, it's the right one. So we link back to the first bullet. So there's a, you can see the danger with this action logic of a certain rigidness um, on the upside of this action logic, that drilling down into detail is often the reason why processes and products are so brilliant. And so it's neither, uh, none of these action logics are intrinsically better. They bring different, uh, different qualities. The biggest bulk of us uh, working in organizations in leadership positions profile at what's described as achiever. The achiever action logic um, uh, is all about delivery, goals, targets, ways to get there. Um, uh, it's, it's agile, uh, it, it, it's intelligent. Um, so uh, it, it's not a, a single effort. It's about teamwork, it's about working with others and it's about a logical process of plan, implement, learn, a plan, implement, deliver, learn. Uh, and so um, uh, very much got goals and targets, very much about structure, very much about focus on, on, on the outcomes. And you can see in that, even in that very brief description, just how important this action logic is and has been to organizational success. You may also get a sense of the partnership between expert and achiever, uh, which may deliver kind of exceptional results. And yet, so the next uh, action logic is described as individualist, um, uh, and we, we get up to 25% of, uh, of people profiling at this action logic. And the move from achiever into individualist is um, uh, a, a shift in focus from results uh, to the process. How do we get there? And, and what about my way of getting there? is new and interesting and so in a way whilst the achievers massively focused on results the individually individualist becomes more focused on their own intrinsic capabilities it's not a selfish turn it's a uh, it's a different kind of consideration but multiple perspectives start to enrich decisions um, and, a, and a sense of flexibility and fluidity uh, starts to emerge um, into this action logic. And then finally, and we get uh, uh, around 5%, something less than 5% of leaders that we profile um, uh, scoring a strategist. Uh, this is a much more systemic perspective. This is built on the previous three action logics um, and is starting to take a view of seeing the system as a dynamic interaction uh, and asking where, uh, where, where do I play in this? Where, where can I most engage? Uh, and so uh, this leads to collaboration and mutual engagement because of course, if it's a system, nobody can, um, uh, can master the entire system. We're all players in the system. Uh, and so there's, a, there's a, a sense of emergence. Plans are useful, but only uh, as far as they take us. Uh, and so we need to be emergent, we need to be agile. And there's a, 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 an introduction of the self uh, into, into this. So often we find that strategists are, strategist leaders are willing to explore, uh, uh, to state their vulnerabilities, to explore them, to be, to be more interpersonally uh, open and, and, and vulnerable. So what this describes is a movement through different ways of seeing the world, different ways of engaging with the world that become increasingly systemically complex and, is, and increasingly systemically capable. Now, I, I started off by saying there's no better. Uh, these are all you know, perfectly fine uh, human meaning making structures. However, and to be absolutely clear about this, uh, if the context is complex, then the later our meaning making, the more likely we are to be able to rise to that complexity. And so I think it's an important consideration when we start to think about our development. So that's taken a very individual perspective. So let me just ask the question now, what does actuarial wisdom look like or what does a wise actuary look like? Uh, and I will, will start by saying, I think the process is to integrate contrasting 
contradictory and paradoxical capabilities to meet expanding cap uh, complexity. And I'm stressing that because um, in this situation, it's often um, a mistake to say what we did before was wrong and what we need to change and do in the future is better. Uh, and and I, I'm certainly not saying that. So for example, um, the quintessential values of accuracy, cautiousness and consistency, which have informed your uh, uh, profession are absolutely vital, um, absolutely vital. And we certainly wouldn't want to lose uh, any of those. And yet, if we to, were to extend those, uh, if we were to make them larger, what would we be extending to? Well, we'd be including judgment, imagination, and creativity into, uh, with, those, um, with those quintessential values. And so what we start to get is a sense of um, where, the, where the inclusive movement might be. So the deep analytical skill set that, 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 that comes with the profession, absolute science, um, uh, very important. And yet your connection with your own sense of things, your gut feel, your intuition, um, your uh, participating with others, your reading widely outside of your sphere, all of those uh, are an extension that are really, really important to, uh, to move beyond uh, the, the only deep analytical skills. It's all about data. It's absolutely about the data. Um, and uh, any of you are operating at any level of seniority in organizations, it's not just about the data, it's about politics, relationships, psychology. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's an engagement that's, that, that's entirely um, uh, bigger than, than the data, but is, the data is vital. Uh, it's, it's a science of probability, of course it is, um, but it also includes an art of possibility and particularly as, uh, as the world changes perhaps more rapidly uh, than it's ever done uh, and the stakes are higher than they've ever been, and I think that's the situation that we're in, then the art of what is, is possible, uh, what organisations can do in these contexts is vital and actuaries play a very significant role in what they bring to the table. Um, Cog in a wheel, an important cog in the wheel, um, actually a system player um, with, with um, in multiple dynamic um, systems. Now this last one might seem like a kind of obvious thing in itself, but I think the stance that we're a system player rather than a cog in the wheel uh, is, is such an important, um, <clears throat> important thing to, uh, to be engaging with. And it's not just a place at the table um, uh, based upon years of experience, always learning um, what in Buddhism, Buddhism is described as beginner's mind, always coming fresh to the, um, uh, to the challenges of the day. And perhaps never before have we needed such a kind of sense of that. So, um, so I think that's, that's the that's the contextual challenge and the uh, and the uh, the question of what it would be to be wiser. And so, in a sense, I I, I just leave you from from that slide with this question for yourself. I think it's a reflective question. If I were to take a step in wisdom, if I were to take an incremental step in wisdom, what would be included in that step? What things would I do differently tomorrow than I do today? Um, and given that, that we all, every single one of us, have the capacity to grow our wisdom, it seems to me that's a question that's absolutely worth us taking a few moments to, uh, to consider. Uh, so um, it may be helpful to know to, the, to that question, uh, I will, I'll, I'll just offer these uh, capabilities. And these are capabilities that we've been working with, uh, with leaders in organizations at, at very senior levels uh, for, you know, for very, very many years. Um, so I think they're, they're, they're worth a brief, a brief mention in that context. Uh, so first of all, uh, the, um, uh, the, capability uh, of inquiry-based experimentation. So I think this is foundational. Um, 
we've got to be curious, we've got to be asking questions, uh, even if we think we know the answer. Um, we need to be um, exploring, particularly with others, but also reflectively by ourselves. And, and that should lead to doing things differently. If we don't do things differently, you know that saying, if we always did what we always did, we'll always get what we always got. So, um, so experimentation is about finding new ways through. And of course, safe to fail experiments uh, are, are often the, the, the ones to use. Things that, where if it does go wrong, doesn't matter too much. In the organizational context, uh, we do hold power. Um, I'm every single one of us on this call holds a certain power. How we use that and how we use it both in collaboration with others, but how we use it with, our, with, with courageousness, I think is a vital, vital question. And uh, one of the, I think perception is, is, is absolutely important. Uh, being able to see things, to understand things is, a, is what we must work at. But if we then don't have the courage to step into the dangerous territory of confronting the status quo, confronting dishonesty, um, uh, confronting bad practice, then, then we're failing and we're, we're failing in the domain of wisdom. And so courageousness, I think, is, a, is, is an absolutely vital um, facet of leadership, um, uh, which uh, has to be linked to fine judgment, uh, has to be based upon fine judgment, but the two together, um, uh, hold an enormous power for a better future. Uh, we need to think about our, our, our use of language. I don't, I'm, I mean, by language here, I mean the way that we speak, the kind of things we choose to focus on um, uh, and how we engage with others. And I think there's something here about, um, uh, about being inclusive, um, about, uh, about creating a positive context for what we say. Um, so a, an inquiring, appreciative, um, uh, openly dynamic a way, a way of talking with others. And of course, as you know, appreciation has an incredible uh, power within that. The, the, the notion, and this has resonated increasingly over the years we've been working this, with this with leaders, of passionate detachment, to be absolutely committed to what I'm committed to, and yet capable of standing back sufficiently that that very commitment doesn't blindside me. Uh, and there's a, I think there's a lifetime's work here in being both passionate and, and adequately detached. And, and on a personal note, almost every leader that I've worked with in the 30 years that I've been lucky enough to be doing this work that I've admired has had this capacity of deep passion and an ability to step back. It's something to be absolutely cultivated as we grow uh, as we grow older uh, and then engages diversity by this i mean the diversity of thinking that it's it's not just a question it's not a gender question solely it's not an ethnicity question solely it's about different thinking different ways that people think uh, and and um, uh, of course that's sometimes embedded in ethnicity and gender and sexual and uh, sexual orientation all of those are important because they bring diversity of thinking. And I think this is a real challenge for all of us uh, is to be more engaged, engaging the, the people who think differently to ourselves. And then finally, but in no way uh, uh, unimportantly, uh, exercises systems leadership. And I talked about that earlier. Actually adopting a stance that this is systemic, whatever's going on right now, this is systemic. What are the, what are the dimensions? of that uh, systemic, um, uh, of the play that I'm seeing uh, in front of me. So these are, these are uh, capabilities which I think uh, we should invest in. Uh, we should be thinking about, about our own, the extent of our own personal capabilities and how we're engaging with these in our, uh, uh, in our lives and in, in, in our work. And I think they are key to the uh, increase in, uh, in, in practical wisdom. So uh, I'll just briefly mention habits because it seems to me it's such, a, uh, it's such an important facet of leadership. Um, so um, you, you wouldn't have got to where you are today if you didn't have some very reliable routines and some very good leadership habits. They're absolutely vital to you. 
Um, the key question is, when do they stop being useful to you? When do they, when do they become um, a hindrance, a limitation? When, when, when you say, so, this is how I do it, this is how it's always been done. When is that a, when is that a serious constraint? Um, and it, it seems to me that, the, that we need to be, uh, that part of this inquiry-based experimentation that I talked about earlier needs to be an aliveness an, of our, our, our own processes and our own habits and our own routines. And we should, we should disturb those at every single opportunity, uh, in, in a way, of course, it doesn't destabilize us. But we should be we should be playing around, perhaps with a with a sense of uh, of, of playfulness. Um, so, um, I'll give you an example. This is a very um, uh, silly example, but it's actually perhaps illustrative. So, um, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, and we talked about cleaning our teeth. You remember, every day you clean your teeth two or three times. You spend a couple of minutes doing it. What do you do in that time? How do you use it? So somebody said to me, well, here's a thing to do. First of all, stand on one leg. Practice your balance, because balance is a really important facet uh, of uh, uh, physical and mental health. So clean your teeth standing on one, on one leg and then swap legs occasionally. So when you've done that, think about which hand do you use to hold the toothbrush, right or left? So I always hold the toothbrush in my right hand. Okay, so hold the toothbrush in your left hand. Brush your teeth with the other hand. So isn't this daft? But in those moments of experimentation, I now have two three-minute sessions each day where my consciousness, my awakeness is pricked by doing something routine differently. Now, how many other things during the day when we're driving, when we're talking to people when we're drinking a coffee, um, when we're preparing for a meeting, how many things could we do radically differently that are so small it doesn't really matter and yet makes a profound uh, impact? So real invitation to think about your habits, to think very constructively uh, and playfully uh, about the things that you do routinely and where you can extend some consciousness and capability uh, uh, with them. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring that to a, a, a to an end here um, uh, uh, by by just saying let's think a little bit about what the um, the developmental implications or strategies might be for you and uh, if anything I've been saying has been connecting with you then you've probably already been uh, lining up some of these for yourself and what I'm about to put on the screen may or may not be relevant um, but. My encouragement would be uh, adapt a stance of inquiry. So allow space for curiosity and not knowing. Be less certain during your day, more questioning, which is not to remove certainty. We know it's a very useful thing, but allow more space for inquiry and curiosity. Um, Check out your habits. We've all been talking about that. Do some things differently if it's only cleaning your teeth. Um, ask yourself and others, uh, what might be going on here that we aren't seeing? Which of course is a profoundly useful systemic uh, uh, question. Uh, it's about the invisible dimensions of the system. But asking that question of others, literally that question, what else might be going on here that we aren't seeing? and as a consequence, develop systemic uh, uh, capabilities. Be a collaborative inquirer. Ask more questions of your colleagues. That simply uh, is, a, is, is a developmental move. Step in and step back. So um, any time you notice yourself being absolutely enthusiastic about something, just take a pause uh, and step uh, and step back a bit and just ask, ask yourself what you're seeing, what's going on, uh, where you are in relationship to this thing. Of course, conversely, uh, if that sense of passion has died, if you're not feeling passion for something, then this is also a good time for reflection as to why uh, and perhaps something needs changing uh, in there. Look for difference and diversity. Uh, the more diverse a system, the more robust it is. We, we, we're absolutely learning this at an ecological level. It's utterly true at, a, uh, at an organizational systemic level. So uh, 
look for and include diversity. And so here, check out your habits, check out your habits of liking to work with people like you um, uh, and, uh, and just ask, well, what can I do differently in, in relational terms? And then finally, um, uh, practice generosity and appreciation. Uh, perhaps nothing, nothing goes further than, than a sense of generosity and appreciation. Uh, and it's a systemic intervention because it magnifies and plays out. So I hope there's some practical thoughts there about the, the, how you might extend yourself. And if you take the, the metaphor of the Russian dolls, uh, and, and imagine yourself as one of those Russian dolls. How's the question? How do I grow? How do I transform? Uh, perhaps some of these, uh, these strategies and, and techniques might be uh, of use to you. So the quote that we started off with um, places us in a, in, in, a, in a truly global context. Uh, our professional work no longer is boundaried by the department we work in, the organization we work for, but we see the interconnectedness of all things. Uh, deep in the heart of that interconnectedness is how we make meaning, how we make sense of things. Uh, and so my real uh, encouragement would be to, um, to join it all up, to be thinking very much about your, your own process uh, of engagement, of meaning making, of, in, uh, of participation in the world. Uh, and how, how that might be extended. So thank you so much for your uh, attention uh, here and uh, I'll stop the share and we'll um, uh, uh, open, in, open the conversation up. Uh, uh, David, um, thank, you, uh, thank you for uh, such an inspiring, profound, engaging and relevant and insightful uh, presentation. Yeah? Uh, and I, it, res it resonates deeply with me, uh, but we've got some precious uh, 40 minutes of discussion, which I would like to start with the panelists and then move to the, to the floor. Yeah. Um, I think it will resonate with us differently and Anusha and Stephen, uh, you are different and I was going to, I'm curious as to what, what parts or what area of David's presentation resonate with you more and maybe you could talk a bit about that. And if you have a question which you want to ask David, you could sort of include in your in your reply. So, so with that, maybe uh, Stephen, I, I could ask you to start a ball rolling. Uh, thank you, Sui Chen and David. That was uh, fantastic. Just a couple of immediate uh, reflections and, and perspectives, and they're all uh, all linked. I think, David. I think what we're talking about is the shift of people moving from being interpreters to having to become sort of sense makers. Of, big shift in expectations, uh, the complexity of the roles are requiring some quite different things, a bigger appreciation of what is really going on, as you said earlier, and, and understanding some quite complex and shifting systems. And I've got probably two, two things linked a little bit. You talked uh, about the dominant action logic of experts being 13% or so. Um, in the actuarial community, we really value expertise. You know, it, it's a hard fought qualification. The specialism uh, is uh, uh, highly valued and appreciated. But we also acknowledge that technical expertise is, is not enough. And I think probably the, the two questions I'd have is uh, uh, at a time of huge uncertainty for people, uh, how do actuaries avoid using their expertise as a comfort blanket and a source of reassurance? And how do they have the sense of self belief and confidence to try some of the things you've said? And I think it's a link question, but how do we make sense or meaning for ourselves and others when things feel so opaque and contradictory? So uh, just two link questions there for you just to think about, David, if that's okay. Shall I respond to those or shall we hear from uh, uh, Anusha? Uh, I think it's uh, your preference because that is a substantive question. You may want to tackle it first. Okay, all right. Well. Uh, I, I hope that it came across um, that, 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 that the expertise uh, is so, so important. You know, 
crikey, um, we wouldn't want somebody who was not, not deeply embedded in, in, in the skills and processes of the profession to be taking responsibility for some of the things that people take responsibility for. So it's absolutely vital. Uh, and yet, I mean, I thought what you said, Stephen, was really interesting, the, the notion of comfort blanket. Um, and I, I don't... I, I don't think we use the comfort blanket consciously. I think what comes with this e expert way of seeing the world is, of course, it's true, isn't it? This is the truth because we've, you know, we believe this for a long time. It's in all the books. This is the truth. This is the known wisdom. Um, and so it, 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 it gives us a certainty, which, of course, is an unconscious um, uh, comfort blanket. Uh, and the danger is it, it, it stops us thinking asking questions, thinking more agilely, um, uh, integrating the, the, the thoughts of others. And so you can imagine, you know, there's a difficult discussion going on around a, a you know, a board, uh, around a board table. Um, uh, and uh, the actuary might be taking a very um, uh, inflexible stance. This is the data. This is what's being said. This is what we must do, uh, rather than engaging in a uh, in a collaborative inquiry that that hypothesizes futures without believing them to be true. Um, so uh, absolutely, my sense is that um, more is going to be offered by someone who both has that deep expertise and can integrate curiosity and exploration and that that curious sense of not knowing, you know, being able to both believe in their methodology and ask where does this where's this methodology limited? Where might it not serve us uh, in, uh, in in this in this context? So I think, think uh, absolutely. Stephen, remind me of the second part. It is. How do we make sense or meaning for ourselves and others when things often feel so opaque or contradictory? Yeah. Well, that that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good question because that's the point it's 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 how do we how do we cope when it's opaque contradictory and highly uncertain and because we're living in highly uncertain times i think that that not being panicked by that but actually going yes that's the nature of things and therefore not trying too quickly to turn the complicated, the complex into the complicated. So, so what I'm stressing here is that some things, a complicated thing um, can be resolved through analysis, but a complex thing has unknown dimensions to it in which only judgment um, uh, can be up. A judgment and analysis, but judgment is important. And so we have to not be panicked uh, into trying to um, reduce things uh, as if there were, weren't unknown variables. So David, I, I just uh, thought that maybe uh, to put it another way is to be comfortable with uh, ambiguity uh, and paradox of, and staying with it for some time before coming to closure. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Not that we want to live permanently in that state. We always need to move to a decision point. It's the question is, how do we make the decisions? What are they based on? And, and uh, as you've just said, how quickly do you, do you move to that? Um, and it seems the more complex, the more likely are we need for a little bit more time for conversation. There, there, are good, there are some interesting questions uh, question coming up from the Q&A, but I, I want Anusha to, to reply to the first opening question about resonance and any general, any questions you would like to, to, to bring to the, to the table. And I suspect you will have a scaffolding of questions on very similar issues, but to a different direction. Yeah? Uh, Anusha, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thanks, Richie. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Uh, so, so first, you know, David, I just, just to pick up from what you just said to Stephen about getting comfortable with ambiguity and, and that whole, you know, uh, sense of confusion in the mind. Um, that's exactly how I feel now after, after your whole uh, session. So, so I'm, I'm just trying to get myself comfortable with it. But, uh, you know, so seriously, it, you know, I just want to thank you for uh, a, a truly very deep and thought you know, provoking uh, uh, sharing. 
which I think is, and so for me, you know, I'm speaking as an, an, an actuary and I'm speaking um, as, as a fairly, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word mature so that I sound, uh, you know, I'm not going to use the word old. Uh, so I, I obviously did the exams in the, in the uh, late 80s, early, early 90s. And at that point, uh, you know, we had to scour through books and and, and memorize stuff and, 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 and the exams overwhelmed us. And, and then when you finish the exams, we're extremely proud of the expertise that we've come out with actuaries, right? We've, we've, you know, we, we earn the right to be in, um, in, the, in, this, in this exclusive profession. And then when we attend meetings, we go into companies, we work, uh, you know, we want to make that, that point known. Uh, but I think that, you know, what you, you cited uh, so importantly is that how do we, uh, you know, so sitting down in a boardroom, for example, and, and having uh, people very senior speaking uh, about more real issues, and then a young actuary speaking up and saying, no, you know, actuarial knowledge says this, and, and this is my, you know, and, and then making that stand. How do we, and, and, and this is where, how do we transition um, the young actuaries and even ourselves uh, from from uh, from uh, and, and so this I, I bring up the the, the the title which is you know the, the actuary who's, who's only an actuary is not uh, real really an actuary uh, how do we uh, you know how do we make them become so from that thirteen percent in the action logic extend ourselves so that we really uh, take uh, bring. Uh, the right side of our minds in you know the creative side the, the emotional side the human side in um, and and how do we start to get comfortable not knowing uh, and and the reality is so so you know if I would just share my own uh, personal experience and and you know if I use the metaphor of uh, the, the the Russian dolls right uh, from 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 a young actuary uh, moving from working in the actuarial department and then and then moving out of the actuarial department into other parts of the business uh, and then trying to play a role uh, in industry, uh, et cetera. We, we have to get, you know, we go into the zone of complete discomfort. It's, it's sort of getting out, uh, out uh, from going in flow to out of flow uh, and, and sort of getting out of our skin. And how do we get back into our skin and feel comfortable in this completely different uh, uh, setting, uh, which we're not trained for. You know, we were trained in a very different setting. Uh, and therefore, how would we use action logics uh, to really help us uh, transform through the different metaphors? So, you know, you're looking at the metaphor of the Russian dolls, uh, to become a leader that has the expert knowledge of an actuary, but is able to really position ourselves uh, in a world that is uncertain, uh, in a world where things are constantly changing. Um, and, uh, you know, you had a picture from, uh, so you had the picture of, of the world and, and what's happening in this world today, uh, the challenging times that we're facing, COVID-19, and then you had a picture of uh, your dad's time and, and the world war. Now, Again, the complexity there is very different because during the World War, uh, and when I spoke to my, I, when I speak to my mother-in-law who went through uh, World War II, she said that she is more frightened today than she was then because then she could see the enemy. Today she can't see the enemy. You know, it's hidden. Uh, and uh, the reality is that we've created. So the world has gone from being more simple to extremely complex. We have made this happen us human beings, we've made it happen. Uh, we've, we've got smarter with brain power, computer power, the logical side, but we've not brought the emotional side along at pace uh, to deal with it. And so, you know, how do we now make this happen is I guess the question I ask and I, you know, yeah. It, yeah, it, it, it is thank really you. something that's thank extremely you. exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, very well put and I, I, I love the the what the way that it was framed um, by your mother or mother-in-law so i think there's i think there's a number of things that we can do um uh, our training experience is important uh, uh, and, and how we how we developed so um 
actually those Russian dolls do represent a, 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 a kind of an evolutionary sequence. So it's absolutely right uh, when we're training young actuaries that we really focus on their expertise. That is the place um, to do that um, in their 20s. That's absolutely the, 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 the time to be propagating that. We then need to ask two questions about how else might we supplement that training? So what other facets uh, might we introduce? So for example, uh, I would say it's absolutely vital that there's a, a, a theme or a module on self-knowledge. Um, uh, who am I? What do I stand for? What do I believe in? Uh, how do I appear to others? That would be a vital part of that of that training, as well as the as well as the expertise. So I think we can go right back to the initial training. Um, I think then uh, how people are developed when they when they come into organisations is really important, and you know, I'm much encouraged by seeing some of the some of the developments of of leadership programmes in organisations and the. The, the, the breadth and depth of, of what's covered in those. But uh, I, I would say this, but those programs need to be inquiry based. The most important thing is not to teach people stuff, it's to help them to, uh, to learn to explore and be curious. Um, I think we can we can do that. I do think experience is tremendously important. And so um, how an organization thinks about moving its actuaries around into different roles. Um, so they, they definitely need some time doing other jobs uh, and getting uh, different perspectives, I think is vital. Uh, and, uh, and if the organization can facilitate this, working in different cultures, different countries, uh, we know that's a deeply developmental activity. So I think there's some things we can do there. And then I think the final ingredient is about how you engage the individual in conscious development. So coaching is a classic uh, way of doing that. Um, uh, and if, if we are supporting people with coaching, then I'd really encourage that it's not solely performance co coaching, that it's kind of, more holistic than that. Um, I also think the idea, um, uh, this has been introduced by a, a, a Harvard um, philosopher, um, Kevin, Ke uh, not Kevin, uh, Keegan, who, um, who talked about deliberately developmental groups, Bob Keegan, de deliberately developmental groups. And the idea is, what, ha what would happen if we engaged with other people, small numbers of other people, with the deliberately developmental intention of working together to extend our capabilities? And the, a deliberately developmental group is a, is a very um, neat, low cost way of doing that. So I'd encourage organizations to be thinking about how to connect their leaders, not just their actuaries, in these de deliberately developmental groups. Um, so, so I think that that's a number of responses that we, we might take. We really thank for such, thank for such a practical uh, reply. And I, I'm going to combine some questions from the floor because they are increasingly we have only got twenty five minutes left. Yeah. So as a process person, so so I would encourage uh, our our collective replies to be shorter and, and to to more succinct, so they can get more questions. So I'm going to combine three questions which are slightly related to what. Anusha asked, but, but with a twist, yeah? So, so uh, with a twist, Abel, uh, Abel Drew, uh, Adele Drew, he said that we live in a world uh, where sometimes the answer, which is more confident, but not necessarily more correct, more confidently expressed are trusted. Uh, um, uh, and they are the people who get promoted. So how do we apply a stance of inquiry when we are not, in an ultimate leadership position and where confidence is encouraged. So there's one, one aspect of it, which I think is slightly linked to a Nick Spencer question, which is about whether these action logics, are they contextual? Different action logics reflect different situations and do leaders show evidence of being able to flex their action logics or are we sort of stuck, not stuck, but we have a strong preference for a particular action logic. So one is about confidence, one is about action logic. And the third question, which I think you can answer because it's, uh, it's, it's from Malcolm Slee, where he talked about uh, whose responsibility is it into developing these leadership skills? Is this the individual? Is this the company? Or is it a profession to which the uh, IFOA, which the individual belongs? Yeah, I think it's a question which 
both uh, Anosha, Stephen, and I could actually respond as well. But I think the three questions is about uh, uh, confidence, uh, contextual or not, and whose responsibility is it? So, so given your enormous experience, uh, could you give us your 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 opinion and your, your insights here? Yeah. So I'll I'll start off with 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 uh, Nick's question because he asks: Do leaders apply uh, the differing action logics uh, in different situations, um, and and to what extent is flexing available to us? Um, so. Um, the, one of the reasons why I like the Russian doll metaphor so so much, um, and it is just a metaphor, uh, is, is that uh, the later doll, the bigger doll, has got the other ones inside it, um, but the earlier doll doesn't have the bigger later doll inside it. If I translate that, um, as, as you move through the action logic, you can use all the earlier ones. They're all available to you by choice. Um, so, so you could, for example, you could be in quite a complex situation, but you can be going, actually, understanding the data is absolutely vital right now. So let's just put everything else aside and drill down to find out what the data says. It's not to believe that that therefore is the answer. It's to, it's to drill down in that capability. But that person is exercising the choice to, 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 to do that. And then they might move on to a much more uh, creative gener uh, generative conversation. So, so I think what happens is that, that people, do, and this is really my experience, people do move through those action logics uh, and they're, they're they're, they're quite, you know, they're quite distinctive and categorical. However, context is really, really important. So um, we can, I notice this all the time, in, in certain teams with some of the later action logics present in the team, the level of conversation is raised. And that encourages people at earlier action logics to enjoin the conversation using skills which are at the upper, let's use that word for a minute, later uh, side of their capability. So in that sense, context is really important. Conversely, I've seen this play out many, many times. Uh, somebody of a, with a later action logic gets a new boss who's got an earlier action logic to them is very controlling, which is often what happens when that's the dynamic. And uh, in that context, often the person with the later action logic shrinks back. They, they pull back defensively. They're, they're in a position where they're not really using their range of skills and capabilities. They're in defensive mode, they're in hurt mode. And, you know, uh, sadly, that's a kind of real reality uh, in organizations. Um, the other, con the other, ne other negative context I've seen um, is that the, the mindset of the organization is so dominantly one action logic. So I worked with one of the big uh, 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 American um, uh, telecommunications companies recently, and they, they profiled 85% of their leaders in, in a kind of medium senior capacity um, as achiever. 85%. So the HR director said to me, is this good news or bad news? Which I thought was an, an interesting question. Uh, of course, it was both, uh, because it's good news in terms of delivery, but bad news in terms of, uh, of, 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 of stretch, and clearly uh, of stretch to deal with complexity. Um, so clearly the context there is limiting and one of the questions that you'd have to ask in that organization, uh, if it's 85% achiever and somebody starts to personally develop into individualist, what happens to them? Are they seen as an asset or are they seen as out of step, out of tune? Now that depends on the culture of the organization, but in the worst context, they're seen as out of step and out of tune. And I have to say one of the dangers for people moving into individualist is that they're, they're no longer seen as on the bus or uh, are you on the pitch or in the stands. Uh, that very reflective capability becomes seen as a, a, as, as a problem rather than, than an asset. And so often people exit either because they choose to or because the organization chooses to, to exit them. So context is absolutely vital. Conversely, an inquiring culture that honors difference, allows 
to some degree, uh, learning from mistakes uh, is, is, uh, is exploratory, is going to act as a yeast to people's development. And we you know we've got some great examples of organizations that have that, that have supported people to, uh, uh, to, to, to move in, in that way. So I've been emphasizing the downside of, of constraint and limitation, but of course there's a there's a parallel uh, upside to that. So I, I think that that then kind of you know comes into Adele's uh, question about uh, about how do we how do we operate um, and, and what part does kind of confidence and inquiry play. And clearly it's more difficult for more junior people to adopt kind of later stage strategies of curiosity and inquiry if their seniors are operating from, from, from a, different, um, a, a different place. Um, one of the real positive things about this, and, I, and, and I, I can't kind of stress this too much, is that the movement into strategist of which less than 5% of us make that meaning-making move, um, enables people to see the system, which means that we get more capacity, more capability to operate within a system that may not be initially receptive to our ideas. Um, and so in a way, what I'm saying is, yes, it's really difficult to influence a system, um, uh, particularly if you're in some sense an outlier to the system, but by developing your own meaning-making capacities, by exploring some of those ideas that I was putting forward, you increase the chances of success. Okay, um, David, there was a last part of the question, uh, which was from Malcolm Slee, uh, but now because there's a new question, I want to combine that and I would also invite Stephen and Anusha to respond. Stephen, and I, I probably have an opinion too, from, from the council and from the leadership, Anusha as a member outside. But the question goes like this, yeah? Malcolm's uh, original question was about the split, the split of responsibility in developing leadership skills. Huh? Is it the individual, the company, uh, employing the individual or the profession, yeah? Uh, so but I'm linking that to a question uh, by Amon Taful. Amon Taful says that, do you think IFOA, uh, actually he used the word I, actual profession, prepare us adequately for great leadership pre-qualification or post-qualification, uh, or is it an individual commitment post-qualification to become the great leader we want? Okay, so, so I think uh, for that, I think Stuart and I could respond sort of on behalf of IFOA and, and uh, this um, Anusha, you could respond as a, as a person, uh, as a member, but, but but David, you, you have also spent quite a bit of time in the last three or four months uh, looking at our literature in our conversation. Your advice is obviously very precious, but is there any particular thing you observe amongst us which makes us vulnerable or there are opportunities for us which is a bit unusual? And, and then also answer this question about responsibility. Uh, where do we go to learn to grow? Yeah. Uh, I think it's me, David and then Stephen Anusha. Me. Yeah, let me sit on that for a bit and let's let's hear from Stephen and Anusha. So you want Stephen to go first, yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think from a, an individual perspective, I, I think there has to be uh, a high degree of responsibility on the individual to be conscious of what they want and what meaning means for them. I have a relative who's not interested in, in work. His fulfillment is uh, in sport and his family. So work, work uh, is a means of, of enabling him to pay for those things. He's very conscious that he will not achieve levels of greatness at work. So I think consciousness and what the consequences are are, are really important. From an employer's perspective, I think, David, you've talked about employers creating a safe space to fail and inquiry. Uh, and I think firms that, that don't enable that will end up with, uh, uh, with, with poorer performance. I think from an IFOA perspective, probably just two reflections. Uh, I mean, the fact we're having this debate uh, is designed to, to help stimulate leadership moving through. But our introduction of reflective CPD last year is a really good step forward about recognising it's not about counting the hours, it's about counting what you've learned. And I think uh, all of those things are, are positive steps moving forward, CJ. Uh, uh, Anusha? Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, so, so for me, uh, you know, as, as a member, uh, 
Now, is it the responsibility of the individual, the company, or the profession? Uh, I'm going to say all three, and, and it's not an attempt at, 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 at taking an easy way out, and I'd like to, to really explain. So, uh, because a lot of our young actuaries, they come into the profession young, and, and uh, you know, at that point in time, they have many things happening. They, you know, there, there's a lot to, to do with, with learning their work and, and proving themselves, and uh, it's it at that stage. I think that the the, the organization, the, the company, plays an important role. And uh, David, I'd like to pick up on something you said earlier. You know, the use of coaching, executive coaching, not focused on performance, but focused on uh, on the person. And 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 here, I think that this is where uh, talent development, people development, uh, organizations now are looking at more. Uh, you know, how do they equip? their people to be able to deal in deal more in this uncertain world. And I think that uh, that side of it is, is becoming more and more important and should be very much part of uh, the, the, the role here. Now, as, as, uh, as the, um, the Institute of Actuaries, the IFOA, uh, I agree with uh, the, the comment earlier by, I think, the, the Ammon, I think, uh, and I actually had it written down as well. Uh, and I, I just want to cite, you know, so immediate past president, you know, I was, I, I'm impressed that, you know, he, he went off to do psychology uh, after becoming a, a fellow uh, and, 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 you know, achieving a lot. Uh, now, I think that uh, in, in, a, in many ways, I don't know if, uh, I, and I know it's, 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 con it's paradoxical, contradictory, so it fit in, fits in very nicely so that, to the words that, that David had used. Uh, but how do we bring the, con the, 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 psycho the psycholo psychology aspects uh, into uh, our, our training uh, so that at a very early stage itself, we start to get the young actuaries uh, learning about it. Because for me personally, I, I will tell you that it's, it's very, you know, I, I, I get into conversations with Sweet Che and I feel extremely challenged uh, in, in mind because he, he's provoking thoughts that we're not comfortable with, but are very important. Uh, and and if only I met him, you know, he he, pro, he he challenged me much earlier, 30 years younger, you know, as they say, right, when you teach a young kid something much, uh, they, they learn it much earlier. And so how do we bring that into our profession, into the training, into uh, even the, the curriculum? I, I, you know, I don't know. So, yeah, that's that's my view. I have some points to make. Uh, David, maybe you, 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 you want to go first or? Okay, please. No, no, please. So, so okay, you, I, I you, you go and okay. then I'll speak. Uh, because, because this is, uh, this, we are, we are having this discussion live on a highly important issue. Firstly, uh, it is our personal ownership for our own development without question. But we are here today because we are members of the IFOA. And when we did the strategy work uh, with the council and the leadership team, uh, the, the instinct is to go into skill sets and domains because that is what we teach, uh, data science and all that. But quickly we realize that it is not about skill sets and domains, it's, it's about mindsets. Yeah? And that is not new. The, the last year's council did not discover that. Uh, what Reddington said uh, really captures it. It's not about accuracy, cautiousness, reticence, and consistency. It is about creating room for impulse and imagination, Ronnie Bowie said that, Jeremy Goldford said that, Peter Clark said that. So, so, so I think, and, and then the world becomes even more complex and then it's a big shift. Yeah? So I think we, not, we need to build this momentum because it is not the place for IFOA to teach uh, psychology as such, as such, because there are a lot of good programs, but it's the place for us to curate a discussion because some of the big challenges of our time cannot be just reliant on our expertise in data. It has to rely on judgment, and, uh, uh, imagination, and challenging the existing systems which are at fault. So the word, so there are three levels, right? One is about being multidisciplinary. The other one is about futures thinking. And the third one is about the mental consciousness. And there's a question on that. I'm not sure we have time to learn on that. So, so this is an exciting time for IFOA and the profession, and we are, and I know that we are going to have this growth mindset series coming out later in the year. I, I just saw an email yesterday. So it's an exciting app. And, and Luis is championing the learning society, right? So let, let's keep this momentum going and, and, and let uh, the communities uh, multiply. Yeah? Uh, so David, uh, uh, the floor is yours. 
Good. Well, I think I'll just keep it. Uh, I think I agree with all, everything that, 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 that's just been said by, um, by Stephen and Lucia and yourself. So it, it, it's clearly, you know, we, it, the responsibility for development sits in, in all of those places. Um, uh, I think what I'd really emphasize is that um, is, is the individual responsibility that it that it sits that that a lot sits with us as individuals. Um, that the I was thinking of that quote. It's something like you know whatever life you choose, that will be your life. So it's like we we as far as we know, we get one go at it. We might get more than one go, but we get one go at it, and 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 we. We've got some conscious choices to make about how, about about how we lead our lives, how we investigate what it is to lead our life, um, and so, at a very very practical level, I just encourage everybody to 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 experiment, to do something unusual, to get out and do something you've not done before. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a kind of concrete example about, oh, I suppose it's about eight or nine years ago now. I, I was tempted to and went on a, a 10 day um, meditation retreat, silent meditation retreat, um, uh, uh, which was unusual, not a thing I had done before. Um, uh, and it was an absolutely an experiment. I had no idea how that would go for me. Uh, and and uh, I have to tell you, it wasn't easy, um, but it actually had a quite profound uh, impact uh, on, on me. Um, and so it was absolutely an experiment and an, an inquiry. Um, and so the question for each of us individually is, um, what would enrich, what would deeply enrich, not just the quality of my life, um, which might be a really great holiday, but also the capacity I have to engage in my life. Um, and, and, you know, we can't will ourselves to do that, we have to expose ourselves to something different. It's not just enough to intend to do it. I'm a very keen tennis player at the moment, um, and I can't will myself to play better. I have to do some things differently to play better. Uh, I've always been deeply resistant to coaching, and I've decided to have a coach. So that's an experiment for me, uh, and actually it's changing things. So the question is, what experiment would enrich the way that you live your life? And I'd really encourage uh, you to, to give some serious thought to that and then playfully engage uh, uh, in it. Uh, so not to say that the profession, not to say that organisations don't have important parts to play, but I think I'd really encourage people to ask the critical question uh, of what they would like to do most with their the opportunities that come from being a professional and having access to resources and the ability to experiment. You know, this is a, a very good note uh, to bring the discussion to a conclusion. I got one or two other questions, but but you were but your answers were important and profound. Yeah, and there was a question on consciousness and mindfulness. And over the last uh, three sessions, we have Hodgson's introducing consciousness, mindfulness, and now meditation. Uh, that is actually a fairly unusual territory for, for actuaries as I know it. But, but let us uh, be patient with this, but, but clearly it's uh, expanding our appreciation of the many issues uh, on which our work sits. Yeah? So I will leave it at that. I, 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 I thank you sincerely for, for the presentation and the time you took to, uh, to spend time with us to, to think about it. Uh, and to reflect on it. And I, and I think it, it certainly resonated very deeply with me and, and I'm sure with the, the audience. So thank you for your time. I need to uh, 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 do some formalities and close the session. Uh, so there's a QR code. Uh, please, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and audience, uh, do, do take the QR code and it'll be sent to you. I need to uh, uh, read, um, bring the uh, event to a close. So thank you for, for all. Uh, for, for attending this uh, session. And I'd like to thank David, uh, especially, uh, for speaking to us. And of course, Stephen uh, and Nusha for their sharing and contribution. Uh, the, the final event is uh, two days time, uh, uh, where past presidents and, and, uh, and, uh, and the chair of the management board will be coming together to talk about 
all these issues actually, uh, the, the, the cultural transformation of the profession. And they will be reflecting on why actuaries need to adapt uh, to move in the wider fields and how the VSMP strategy and our attempts and our efforts in thought leadership can support this reinvention. So I hope many of you or all of you could join us roughly at the same time in two days time on Friday. So it con this concludes today's event and thank you all once again for joining us and goodbye. Thank you very much for the chance to speak.